I don't know exactly how old I was. I think I was around four or five. And uh, I had a run-in with my mom. Bless her heart. I don't know if she'll remember this, but I'm sorry to say I know it will be hard for you to believe, but I had a temper tantrum. <laughs> and I ran away from home. And to show mom that I was serious, I packed my only my important stuff, like my favorite dolly, my six-shooter cap guns. You never know when you'll run into bad guys. And then um, I packed my Hershey bar that I kept in the nightstand just for emergencies. And uh, then with my teddy bear in hand, I stomped out the door, and I walked across the street to a field. I marched halfway through that field, and to my surprise, Mom didn't come running after me. Oh, honey, please don't go. Oh, don't go. I love you so much. She never came. And I kept walking. And pretty soon, my fast walking turned into a stroll and then down to a stop. And I sat behind a hay bale looking out at the house. And I sat behind that hay bale eating my Hershey bar. And when it was done, I turned around and I looked at the house again. Funny thing, I saw my dad out in the front yard and uh, he was mowing the lawn. He had mowed the lawn just an hour or two before, but I guess he missed some spots. And he kept mowing and he looked toward the field, toward me. And as I sat there, it dawned on me, you know what, this doesn't feel real good. This hadn't turned out the way I had planned. That warm Saturday afternoon, I experienced my first case of homesickness. There's no word in the English language that stirs our hearts like that blessed word, home. I mean, we sing about it at this time of the year. There's no place like home for the holidays. Or our ensemble did such a beautiful job with that. I'll be home for Christmas. I just love those songs. They're beautiful. There's just something about home that, that stirs all kinds of memories. And sometimes they're warm and fuzzy memories that feel so good. And sometimes they're not so good. But within every human soul, God has placed a homing device something in our heart that, that longs for home, and we're unsettled until we find it. Why is home so important? Well, home is where we first learn who we are. Think about it. It's where we receive our name, and we begin to receive our identity. Home really shapes us. In fact, there's this sociologist, his name is Stephen Nock, and he says, Family is the most profound of all influences on who we are and what we do. The families to which we are born and those in which we live as adults shape us from birth to death. They are the immediate cause of our best and sometimes worst times. So much of who we become is shaped by the faith and the values of those who raised us. And that's why Moses in the middle of the wilderness, he called all the Israelites together, and he gave them this word. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. I wonder what would happen if all of our parents in this world truly loved the Lord with their whole hearts, with their whole souls, with everything, and then would impress this devotion. And in the Hebrew, that word really isn't press or to force, but it is to diligently teach to diligently teach this devotion, this way of life to our children. I think that kids everywhere would grow up with a better understanding of who they are, of who God is, and what the world is all about, and our place in this world. Home, 
It shapes our identity in profound ways. And home is also supposed to be safe. The psalmist says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. These little birds were considered the most vulnerable creatures in the ancient world. And yet God allowed them to build their nests near his altar where they could have their young and care for them right there at the temple. There was safety near God's temple then, and there is safety near God's temple, near God's family today. We are God's temple. We are God's family. You try to live and you pursue your dreams alone, apart from others who don't care for you or care about you, apart from those who don't speak the truth and love to you, and life gets a little unsafe, doesn't it? Even for those of us who love solitude, we need people in our lives who love us and affirm us and hold us in line with who God is calling us to be. Home is supposed to be where you're safe, where you're cared for. And can I just add something to this right now? It's not okay with God if home is unsafe. When it becomes abusive or violent, if that is the condition you're in or you know someone else is in, please contact a pastor who loves you. Contact a spiritual friend or a, a spirit-filled counselor. And if you need to get out because it's safe, then get out to be safe. Please be careful. It is not okay with God when home is scary. Help us, Lord. May our homes be safe. We long for home because it's where we find our identity. It is where we pray we are safe and where we're supposed to belong. Home is supposed to be where you're welcomed and accepted and celebrated, not just because of all the things you do or all the things you accomplish, but home is where you belong because you are you and you're loved for being you. A family moved to a big city and they couldn't find a place to rent, so they spent a week in a downtown hotel. And the hotel manager looked out and he saw the little girl of the family playing in the lobby. And he said to her, oh, honey, I'm so sorry you don't have a home yet. And she looked up and smiled. Oh, we do have a home. All we need is a house to put it in. <laughs> See, I found along the way that home is not so much where you are, but it's who you're with. When God, family, and friends are in your life, it's a good thing. According to the Bible, home is supposed to be where you can rest. Way back in Genesis, after the big flood, well, Noah sent a dove out, remember, to find some land to let them know it was okay. The water was receding. But the dove comes back. Remember what happened? And it says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 9, she could not find a place to rest the sole of her foot. She couldn't find a place of rest. That Hebrew term for place of rest is manoach. And that's another Hebrew word for home. Home, manoach. That dove tried to fly home. But because she couldn't land anywhere, she had to come back. Home is supposed to be where we can land, land the sole of our feet and stop and rest. There are some moms and dads are saying, ha, funny thing, I don't feel very restful in our home. It's crazy where we live. There's little rest in our house, many parents would say, trying to make ends meet, trying to get kids off to school and ballet and soccer practice, Girl Scouts, it can be so crazy. A poll was taken of families all over the U.S. And you know what this, the most wonderful treasured room in the house is? What do you think it is? Oh, the dining room, that's good. The kitchen. 
uh, dads and kids, they love the kitchen because that's the place where the fresh cookies are, the hot chocolate is. We just love to gather around the kitchen, and when you're a mom trying to prepare a dinner, it's crazy, isn't it? Most of the husbands and kids, they love the kitchen, but guess what young moms love? <laughs> that's it, the bathroom. <laughs> because you can go in there and lock the door just for a few precious moments and be alone and still. Oh, my goodness. Some of us feel like that dove in the flood story. Some of us are exhausted, and we're trying to just find a place to land our hearts where it just feels right. We search and we search, but we're not quite there. And sometimes you feel a little bit lost because you're not quite sure where your heart's going to land. Being lost and wandering is not what God has in mind for us. You see, he didn't just create Adam and Eve. He created a home for them. Eden, Eden was home, not just because they had all the food and the shelter they needed, but God was there. And he, he'd come to walk with them in the cool of the day, but that didn't last, did it? After Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were cast out of home, cast out of the garden, and in some ways, they became homeless. And in many ways, we became homeless as well. I looked through the Bible, and I looked at Moses. If anybody knows what homelessness is, I think he would. Moses was the great lawgiver. He was the great deliverer of the Israelites. But he really didn't have much of a home throughout much of his life. He was born a Hebrew in Egypt, destined for slavery or death. Not a safe time to be a Hebrew. He was ripped from his home as a baby and raised as an orphan in the Egyptian courts. When he grows up, he has to flee that home because he kills an Egyptian and he has to run away as a fugitive to the, to the Midian desert. And then God calls him from that burning bush, and he has to leave that home in the desert to go back to Egypt to lead the Israelites out of captivity. And Moses spends the next 40 years leading the Israelites while living in tents in the wilderness. As it turns out, Moses never entered the promised land except later when he's with Jesus in the New Testament. But that's okay. Because you know what? Moses found home right in the middle of nowhere. Listen to the words of the only psalm we believe Moses wrote in the Old Testament, Psalm 90, the first verse. Lord, you have been our dwelling place, our home throughout all generations. This is the cry of a homeless man. God, you are our home, our dwelling place. He's figured it out. Home is not necessarily a house or a tent. Home is where God is. Moses says to be with God, that's what it means to be home. And the psalmist picks up on this in Psalm 91. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shelter of the Almighty, in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. You are my home. God is our home. Our longing to be loved, to be safe, to belong, to have rest is found in God. And I don't care how grown up we are, we try to be. Inside all of us, we are children who want to be home. We want to be home. We want God for all that good stuff, don't we? We want to feel that safety. We want God's presence. But we don't always want God to run our lives. What we want to do, we want to stay in charge. So we pack up our toys and we take off in pursuit of our own dreams. And some of us today are still marching to our own tune hiding behind our own hay bales. We think we're calling the shots, but you know what? It just doesn't feel quite right until we come back to Jesus, our true home. We come to God. We're all in some ways runaways. 
The cool thing is we have a heavenly father who waits for us, just like my dad mowing the lawn for the 10th time. The neat thing is he doesn't just wait, but our God reaches out to us, and that's what this season is all about, finding our way back home. It's not just to a place and not even just to a family, but to find our way back closer to God. Throughout history, God has been calling us to come home to him. But he didn't just call us, he showed us the way. I just love this. As you walk through the Bible, in the Old Testament, he made a covenant at Mount Sinai with his own people, the Israelites. He showed them how to worship and how to have relationship with him, how to follow him, how to treat each other, and how to treat people outside the fold, even Gentiles. And then he sent prophets to remind his own people, this is what you're supposed to do. Don't stray. Come back. Come home. At the perfect time, a Messiah would come from that group, his own people, and his own son would be born, the prophets tell us, in Bethlehem. He would come from the line of Judah, and he would be born of a virgin. In the New Testament, God makes a new covenant on Mount Calvary, another mountain, new covenant. But this one is to the whole world, with so ever who would believe in his son. This covenant is inaugurated when Jesus dies on that cross for our sins. But to die, to die for us, he had to become one of us. And so one night, when no one was looking, he arrives as a baby. There were incredible signs to announce his coming. He sent Mary an angel to tell her that she was the one from whose womb would come the Messiah. God gave Joseph an angel to tell him to take Mary and the babe as his own. God gave shepherds angels to announce the Messiah had arrived. And God gave the wise men that star or whatever that bright thing was in the sky to direct them to finally find the Christ child. You talk about love. The star, the angels, those miraculous births, all of these were signs to usher the Son of God into the world. God the Father provided the way for people to find his Son. And God the Son provided the way for people to find their way home to the Father. He is a way, the way in the manger. You talk about love. Jesus gave up his heavenly home to be born as that fragile little baby so that the weakest of the weak would feel welcome in his presence. He was born in a borrowed stable so that the poorest of the poor would feel welcome and valued. He was born of a humble family so that those bent over by illness or discouragement would feel welcome and cherished. Jesus went out of his way to make sure we could find our way home to heaven. And you know what? We could just wrap this up tightly and end here. But the reality is God calls us to bring others home as well. This isn't just for me. This isn't just for us. This is for them, those who are out there who need to find their way home. And I pray through us they may find him. We could wrap it up here, but we're to call people to join us as we go home. And they're not just the people we get along with. We all have relationships that are kind of scratchy. There's something about them that makes us feel a little on edge, a little defensive. Do you have relationships like that in your life? Around the Christmas table at this time of year, there may be some stressed out people people like Mary and Joseph. When we see Mary and Joseph at that manger, they look so together. They look so at peace. But their life in the Christmas story was not peaceful. It was stressed. There was stress of ridicule, 
from their hometown friends because they had a baby that wasn't Joseph's. There was the stress of taking that long trip to Bethlehem when Mary's just about to give birth. There was the stress of arriving in Bethlehem, and there was no place to stay. Can you imagine the conversation when they came into town? Joseph, you don't have a room? You don't have relatives to call on? What were you thinking? I'm about to go into labor. Help! We have stressed people in our lives. Maybe those stressed people are you and me. Life has taken a major detour in your life this last year, and we desperately need God to speak into our craziness. Peace be still. We have stressful people in our life, and sometimes there are unsafe people in our life. They may not be murderers like Herod, no, but they still scare us. They are unpredictable. They are usually plagued by lots of insecurity. I worked with some news directors like that. They were dishonest, they were manipulative, and when I was with them, I always felt less than I am. You know, it's crazy, as much as I tried to keep my distance from those enemies, God pressed me to pray for them. And as I prayed, my heart began to grieve for them. God changed my heart. We have embarrassing people in our lives. I think about those shepherds up there in the hills. Yes, they were there to probably prepare the lambs for, for uh, the sacrifices down at the temple, but they were looked down on because they were unclean, and frankly, I have a feeling they smelled bad. What do you do with those people who just don't quite fit? Who have personalities that are grating, and, and they just kind of you just don't want to be around them. And what about those different people in our lives, those people who are not like us at all? They don't share our values. They, they look different, like the Magi. God somehow brought them into the Christmas story. They look different. They worship different. They, they spoke and they acted different, but they somehow found their way to Jesus. Do you have family or friends who are different who are sometimes hard to love, people who are not like you. Um, it's crazy because the Christmas story contains people who are different, embarrassing, unsafe, stressed people. They're all included in that story. And I have a feeling they're a part of our stories. Should we welcome them, or do we kind of keep our distance with a curt comment here and there. What do we do with those people who aren't easy to love? Well, I think the answer lies in that manger that night in Bethlehem when perfect love entered the world. If you were God, would you sleep on straw or be clothed in a diaper? I wouldn't, but Jesus did. If you knew that those you loved would someday laugh at your face and mock you, would you still love and care for them? Jesus did. He went from holding stars to clutching Mary's finger. Those hands that held the universe would someday be pierced by nails. Why? Because that's what love does. It stretches. It sometimes bends. It forgives and it bleeds. It does whatever it must so that people like you and me can find our way home. And I pray, as we go home, we bring others with us. May this Christmas draw you close, so close, to the holy heart of God. And while you're at it, bring friends with you who need his touch and his peace forever. You know, I've always had trouble with that word sinner in that last phrase because I am a redeemed sinner. But what this blessed song reminds me is I'm still vulnerable 
And there can be things in me that are not much like Jesus at all. So I invite you to just ask the Lord in this blessed day, is there anything in me that's not like you? Is there anything in me that's preventing somebody from drawing close and coming home? Show me, Lord. I invite you, Lord, to forgive me and to help me represent you well to everybody I meet, even those who are a little embarrassing, different, sometimes plain outright unsafe. But help me, almighty God, to offer them the mercy you've offered me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. God bless you. Merry Christmas. And I hope to see you tonight at 6. Turn to a brother or sister and say, Merry Christmas. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>